and we executed over 300 subpoenas, search warrants pertaining to this individual to find out more information. Uh, one of the things that we did is we followed him because we wanted to get an abandonment sample of his DNA, uh, which we were able to do. Some curious items were recovered from the search of Rex Huerman's property. What things did the accused Gilgo Beach serial killer have in his possession that may prove pivotal to his case? Professor of Law Jules Epstein comes back on to break it all down. Welcome to Sidebar, presented by Law & Crime. I'm Jesse Weber. So I really want to talk about the very latest in the Gilgo Beach serial killer case out of New York. I'm talking about the incredible arrest of 59-year-old architect Rex Hewerman for the murders of three women, Melissa Bartholomew, Megan Waterman, and Amber Costello. Their bodies were found back in 2010 near that Long Island beach. I'll tell you what, I'm actually from Long Island. I remember following this case about 10 years ago when I was studying criminal law in law school. That's how long I've been following it. Well, you might recall that there were 11 sets of human remains that were ultimately found in that area. And now it's a question of whether Hewerman is going to be charged with respect to the deaths of any other people. He's actually the main suspect in the 2007 disappearance of Maureen Brainerd Barnes. And we know authorities, through extensive investigative work, have tracked Hewerman to this cold case through all different sorts of evidence. Burner phones, junk email accounts that he allegedly used. There was a car linked to the defendant that was tied back to the murder of Costello. Uh, there was DNA, specifically from his wife, and more directly for him, tying back to the crime scene. I mean, we're talking about DNA where apparently authorities matched DNA of a male hair that was taken off of one of the victim's bodies, the burlap that was used to wrap one of the victims. And that was matched to DNA taken off of a pizza crust that was thrown away by Hewerman. They collected it from a Manhattan trash can. Pretty incredible work. But what I want to get into today is now what are investigators reportedly finding after searching his property? And for that discussion, it is time to bring back in a good friend of us here on Sidebar, Professor Jules Epstein. Professor Epstein is the Edward D. Allbaum Professor of Law and Director of Advocacy Programs at Temple University Beasley School of Law, and he joins us once again. Professor, so good to see you. Thank you for having me on and for all the great coverage you do. Well, thank you for that. Um, you are a fan favorite, and I want to start with because we haven't talked about the case yet. So before we even get into what authorities are reportedly finding and its significance to the investigation, let me just get your overall thoughts on Hewerman's arrest and the evidence that they have against him. If you could summarize real quick what you think, um, how strong is it in your opinion? Because when I'm looking at it, it seems pretty strong. So there's a tremendous circumstantial evidence case against him. There's a tremendous suspicion case against him. Um, and the fight is going to be about the DNA. And the reason I say it is this. My DNA could be on a body because I killed the person. Or my DNA could be on a body because they were in my car and got out of my car. And we call that transfer DNA. And I have to imagine that that's going to be a concern. Um, let me just finish answering your question this way. There's, with everything they've found, does he look guilty? And then how much of that will be admissible in court to mm. prove him guilty? Those may be two very different questions. And I, I would love to continue yeah. as this case progresses where we can talk about that and potentially, you know, at a trial. Um, but talking about evidence that might be admissible, we're trying to understand what police are finding right now. And I think this is really interesting because I want to get into these searches. So the Suffolk County District Attorney Raymond Tierney, Tierney, he said, quote, we've executed a great number of search warrants over a great many different places. And we're looking for everything from large items to molecular items like blood, DNA, trace evidence, hair. But to take a step back, let's talk about a search warrant for a second, because usually what is it listed as items to be searched for in a search warrant? We know that they're looking at his uh, his house. We're looking at they're looking at storage lockers. Walk us through what's supposed to be listed. Well, number one is a search warrant has to have a list. Um, just part of the United States Constitution is search warrants have to be particular. They can't say, hi, we'd like to search your house 
for God knows what. So presumably it lists clothing of the victims, souvenir is a horrible term, right? But things kept from the victims, uh, the type of materials used to wrap the bodies, maybe phone records or things showing communications. Hopefully they will have a list of particular items that we would logically think could connect to this crime. Um, there's a problem even if they have the list. And I'm sure that they did because judges are not supposed to sign these wholesale look for whatever you want warrants. The last crime, correct me if I'm wrong, was 13 years ago. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Well, that, that as far as we know, right? Because we well, don't know what else you might have been up to, but yeah. But in terms of the women whose deaths they're investigating, we're going back to 2010. You mentioned one was 2007. So if it was now 2011 and he became a suspect, we'd say, okay, probably likely there's something in his house. Now let's go to 2012. Well, a little less likely. One thing a judge is going to have to decide, we call it in the law, staleness. Whether maybe there was probable cause to search his home in 2013, in 2014, what are the odds that items related to the crime would be there 13 years later? Mm. Hey, That's an interesting good. point. Let, let, let me just amplify that for a second. Yeah, so hey. the way that I understand it, if they're trying to find evidence, not just to tie him to these three women that he's already charged with, but if they're trying to see if he's connected to other crimes, maybe the other bodies or maybe something they're not uh, familiar with, 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 they're limited in what they can do? Well, remember, I can't get a warrant for your house for crimes I'm just guessing about. Right. So let's take it just with the three women. Let's assume they have probable cause. He killed these three women. That's probable cause to arrest. To get probable cause to search, you have to say there's some likelihood that something from that crime used mm. to commit that crime, a, a link evidentially to that crime is in his house today. Okay, let me give you an example when I used to teach this. I uh, suppose I'm charged with the theft of ice cream. I don't want to even think of that, but let's let's and let's I, keep going on I, with this I example. Of friends, right? How long do you think that ice cream is still going to be in my house? That's a good point. Okay, I'm going to eat it, right? Now, if it's a shooting, well, you probably have the gun. Maybe you keep the gun a year or two later. Maybe you keep mm -hmm, the guns mm -hmm. longer. If it's a stolen money, I'm going to spend the money. Where is the drop-off point? A prosecutor would argue that in a case like this, with a guy who lives a life like he did, a sort of hermit's life, that there is a longer lifespan for the evidence in the home. A defense attorney would say, well, wait a minute, that's just made up guesswork. And we have to have something tangible to say, what are the odds? And if a judge says, whoa, this information is stale, mm -hmm. then the what we call the fruits, the product of the searches could be disallowed at trial. So wow. a big fight is going to be, is it stale? Interesting. Okay, well, that's good to keep in mind because now I wanted to get through some of the items that are reportedly found. Right. So they're search, they're search, they searched his home in Massapequa Park, New York. And I want to start with the guns. Apparently, authorities found between 200 and 300 firearms. They were locked in a vault in his basement. Pistols, revolvers, semi-automatic rifles. It only seems like a fraction of those were actually registered with New York State. The Suffolk County uh, Police Commissioner uh, Rodney Harrison told Fox News, anytime anybody has that type of arsenal, we have some concerns. Why do you think that's of interest to authorities? Well, there are two ways it can be of interest. One is we don't even know how these women died. Right. So Lord knows if we can link a gun or 
the notion of a gun to any of the women. Separately, there's a doctrine in the law called plain view. If I'm legally in your house searching for the women's clothing, as an example, and I see an illegal gun in plain view, I was allowed to be there to look for the clothing, but oops, in right in front of my face is something illegal. I can take it even if it's not in that list on the warrant. Mm. So it's possible, I haven't read all the papers here, that they could go in and say, we are seizing the guns because some of them are illegal. They may also be seizing the guns, not as evidence, but as kind of called a public safety issue. We've got a home where we're taking a guy out. Who knows who's going to do it? We can't have guns left lying around. So, so are they using it for evidence in the murder cases? Lord knows. Is there something illegal about the number? Maybe. Or about some of them not registered? Who knows? Is there some reason to just, for the protection of all of us, put them somewhere safe? You bet. Yeah, and I think he has permits again for like 92 handguns, but maybe some of them are not accounted for. And clearly they didn't want to arrest him in that home because imagine it was a standoff situation, could have been very dangerous. We know that they apprehended him on the streets of New York City. Um, I want to move on to this very weird item. Something investigators said was out of place. A doll, a life-sized doll in a glass case that wasn't in any of his children's rooms. That's what's being reported. Why is that of interest? Why is that being taken out? Okay. Um, the allegation here is that each of these women was a sex worker, or an escort. If I understand the allegation, it is that he hired them and then murdered them. And so they are trying to show, I assume, some particular sexual fascination, fetish, or something. I get it. That's important from an investigative uh, perspective. Whether it's going to be admissible at trial is a different issue. And here's why. Um, if I'm charged with murder, you're not allowed to say, well, in general, Jules is a bad guy, or Jules is a violent guy, or Jules is a sick guy. We're supposed to charge you on what you did, not on your character. Having a blow-up sex doll, if that's what it is, is what kind of person I am, my character. A prosecutor would argue, no, no, no. We're not using it to say in general, oh, he's sick or he's perverted. We're using it to show it's part of his fascination with hookers or escorts. They're going to try and make it very linked to the behavior in this case. The defense is going to say, no, that's a sort of general attack. It relates to they took out a bunch of playboys. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and by the way, if, if, if they assume DNA, can they just pick something out if they think there might be DNA on it? They might think they have DNA on it that can match up to DNA on the crime scene or the bodies. If they, do they just pick things out? Oh, that might have DNA. Um, that would depend on what the warrant says. Okay. 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 Because remember the plain view thing. Number one, let's assume the warrant lists bed sheets. I've got yep. that. Yep. Uh, use condoms. I've got that. And then they see this doll. It's not on the warrant. So then it has to be apparent, plain view, that this is illegal or evidence. If there's this speculation thing, a judge might say, you could not seize it. Let me amplify that for a moment, because this ties into the other thing that they found. And, and I'm going to tie in the doll with this other uh, piece of evidence. So. There was apparently, they removed a portrait of what appears to be a battered woman. I actually saw the photo. I don't remember if it was in the New York Post or the Daily Mail, but you see it. And it appears to be a blonde woman with bruises on her face. Now, you might be saying, why are they taking that? Why did they take the doll? This is what my take is, and I'm curious your take. I think it is imperative for investigators to show 
that those burner phones and those searches on his burner phones are his, right? And I think, you know, showing that the burner phones were his, it helps to track his location. It happens to, sh- happens to show that he might have been contacting the victims or the victim's family. So it's very important to show those phones, those internet searches are, are, are for him. Now, what am I talking about with the searches? I'm going to list some of them out. They're really disgusting, but I think they're important here. One of them is girl begging for rape porn. And again, this is what he allegedly searched on burner phones using fake accounts. Pretty girl with bruised face porn. Torture redhead porn. Girl with face beat up. So couldn't investigators say, hey, listen, we know this is his phone. We know this is his searches. He's got a portrait of a battered woman. He's got a life-sized sex doll, if that's what it is. Can investigators use that to show that this is his property? This is his phone? The answer is yes, as an investigative tool, maybe or maybe not at trial. So here's what's going on, okay? Obviously, if the phone said his name and it has his thumbprint as the security thing to open it, it's his phone. Right. What you're saying is, I'm going to take two and two and make four. He's got a portrait of battered woman, and then he's got a phone with searches about battered women. Um, That may not be precisely two and two makes four. That may be one and one make two, but we've got to get to four. But it's partway there because, sadly, lots of people in this world may have those kind of pictures and may have mm-hmm. those kind of interests. But even if even if a judge says, you know, no, 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 that's enough. That proves it's his phone. Well, that's one message of that picture and of those searches. But the other message is we're back to here's a really sick dude. Here's a really anti-woman violence against woman person, we're back to character. Mm -hmm. You do searches, that's your character. Therefore, you're more likely to hurt women. And that's not allowed. That's not allowed in. That's propensity evidence. That's propensity evidence. Although I did some research for you today because I want to be on top of this. New York law has a couple of cases that say no. Thoughts are different from propensity. Mm. And something like an internet search is a thought. Something like having a portrait is a thought as opposed to, oh, we can show he did it to some other woman some other time. And so there's at least a couple of cases that says this comes in to show a general hatred against women, therefore a more likely, so they would call it motive, not propensity that's as best i can tell still accepted law in new york so right. each each state can have its own if you will bandwidth or tolerance of how much of this everybody's heard the words prior bad acts okay right the real technical term in the law is other acts because they don't have to be prior, they can be after, but they have to link. Um, Every state can have its own bandwidth on how much or how little they allow. I will say bluntly, I was shocked to read what New York says about thoughts being allowable, but they do. So a New York judge is going to have to deal with that. And and by the way, I I should make it clear, because we have a few more pieces of evidence that we're talking about here, or or alleged evidence. This is you know, speculation. We're looking at the reports of what they took. um, We're looking at pictures of what they took. So we're we're kind of looking through the pieces here. But I think this is a really interesting discussion about what's being taken and what might play a role in his trial, which brings me to another piece. So the Daily Mail has a picture of investigators placing newspaper clippings in an evidence bin. Now, my take is they appear to be old newspaper clippings. We don't know what they say. We don't know when they're from. I do think it is interesting if they were clippings, let's assume for a moment, of the Gilgo Beach serial killer in light of his alleged online search history. Going back to those burner phones, those fake accounts, he allegedly searched, quote, why could law enforcement not trace the calls made by the Long Island serial killer? Why hasn't the Long Island serial killer been caught? Long Island killer. 
Long Island Serial Killer Phone Call, Long Island Serial Killer Update, Long Island Serial Killer Update 2022. It goes on and on. And we know that a, a woman, I think a, a, a um, an escort actually came forward recently and said that she went on a date with Rex Uriman and he was asking her about the Gilgo Beach uh, serial killer. And, and by the way, he was also looking up the, or allegedly looking up the victims as well. So I wonder if those newspaper clippings, let's assume they're of the Gilgo Beach killer. Uh, I imagine that might come into evidence to show he was looking about it. He was interested in it. Why else? It's not just a fascination. It's because he was worried about getting caught. So that, unlike having the doll, unlike looking up porn or beating up women, is this case. And a fascination with this case certainly has, here's the magic word, relevance, right? Um, Most of us don't get involved in other stuff, you know, and and go spend, well, I do now, right? My search (laughs) history is probably like his because you asked me to get ready for this case. Uh, for this program. But that's but, understandable. You know, You're talking right, about right, it. Right, right. I, I got a professional excuse. Okay. Uh, normally, right, that doesn't. So that courts could easily say that's relevant. That's in a weird way, like souvenirs. Yeah. Right. Some fascination with this case. It certainly should not be enough alone to convict anyone, but it is a piece of relevant evidence. Um, that ought to come in. And, you know, speaking of souvenirs, I know they're looking at storage units, his house for souvenirs, trophies, body parts, things that he might have taken really disturbing to think about. Um, Now, Professor, again, I would love to know everything that they took. But the last part that I want to talk about that I think is could be significant is it appears they took a picture of a life jacket. Um, I think that's significant because we think about where the bodies were deposited. Um, what's your take on what they might be trying to find from the life jacket? That one is, I'm unclear. I couldn't figure that out. It could be, I mean, it's weird because I don't, it's not clear that he used a boat to deposit Mm -hmm. the body, right? As I've, I understood it, you could drive there. Um, so what that is, I don't know whether there's something, please remember, police don't, and wisely don't reveal everything about crimes because if they ever catch someone, they want to have some hidden information. And if the person talks about it, that might be an indicator of guilt. Um, Lord knows, I do know, and maybe this connects with it, that they took out a piece of tarp. Mm -hmm. And that, that one makes sense to see if the same kind of tarp as of the burlap or whatever it was that the bodies were wrapped in, um, right? That's going to be looking for a forensic match, but I'm with you. I'm scratching my head. I, I, uh, I would just head. say maybe, maybe, maybe with the life jacket, if they think he deposited something into the water, um, because you, maybe he was, there's parts or maybe there's bodies that they're not aware of and maybe use that as a way to deposit in the water itself. Really interesting questions. If I have a life jacket in my house today, is that any proof I had it in 2010? That's a good point. Is that any, right? So we've got to, right? Or that I, maybe it's a newer one, but then I had an older one. You know, we've yeah. got to link it back somehow. But again, two questions are going to be here. What is it? And were they allowed to take it under the warrant? I'll do one last honorable mention. I don't think it's particularly significant. I thought it was interesting. It's kind of sad. They they took his cat. I mean, what do they do with the cat? Is it? I I, I don't know if they're trying to find evidence of the cat or just take it to a shelter. What do you think? Uh, so my first response was take it to a shelter. On yeah. the other hand, I don't know what's wrapped up with the bodies. Mm. I also don't know how old the cat is. Yeah. Okay. So we had a cat for eighteen years. Our current cat is seven. The seven-year-old cat wouldn't be very helpful for an old murder. (laughs) If there's any cat hair on the bodies, maybe they could be looking for a match there. That's totally a guess. I, I, you know, I'm just glad that they didn't leave the cat in that, what is frankly a not pleasant house. 
Yeah, they talk about how cluttered that house was. They call him a monster, but uh, look, he's innocent until proven guilty. We have to make it clear. But uh, look, the evidence that they've laid out is is you know pretty significant. And by the way, they're also you know not only searching his house, the storage lockers. They're looking into things in South Carolina, Las Vegas, seeing if he has a connection, to anything there. If he left any evidence, it's a pretty fascinating case. And again, it just happens. So we're kind of in the throes of it. Professor Jules Epstein, you are a pleasure. Thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, really do always appreciate it. All right, take care, friends. And that's all we have for you here on Sidebar, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Jesse Weber. Speak to you next time. Thank you.